the Atacama Desert is easily one of the harshest ecosystems on Earth. This is the world's driest true desert, with so little water that some regions have never gotten rain in recorded history. The animals that cling to life here are pushed to the absolute extreme, and today we've come to figure out how they survive in this brutal habitat and what we can learn from them. My name is Evan, and this is Harrison. We're twin brothers on a mission to tell the stories of the most extreme animals on Earth, something the Atacama has no shortage of, and no group proves that better than invertebrates. Despite the scorching heat and endless supply of predators, they thrive in this environment, and their ingenious solutions to the challenges of desert life could hold the key to solving the problems that people face here too. Because when some of the world's most infamous inverts live right alongside us, conflict is bound to occur. So here in this vial, we have the Chilean redback spider. Now the first thing you'll notice with this spider is that incredible coloration. Jet black body with a bright red mark on the back of their abdomen. And that looks strikingly similar to a black widow. And that is no accident, because this spider is actually in the genus Latrodectus, the same as our black widows back home in the United States. Now, we don't know as much about the South American Latrodectus species as we do the black widows back home, but what we do know is that they have a very potent neurotoxic venom. A bite from this spider would be very, very unpleasant for us. It's unlikely to be lethal, just like our widows back home, but you would be in a world of pain. Lots of muscle spasms, cramps, pain all over your body as the neurotoxin works its way through your system and lets your body know that you are in trouble. Now, that venom would certainly do a number on a predator, but that is actually not its main function. What they really need it for is catching their prey. This is a largely sedentary species. They're gonna be spending the majority of their time tucked into their webs deep in vegetation, under rocks or logs, anywhere where they're not exposed to potential predators. But because it's so hot out here in the desert and meals are so infrequent, they need to be able to capitalize on every opportunity to get food as soon as it presents itself. So for this spider, what that will look like is any kind of insect or other arthropod wandering into the spider's web. And as soon as the redback detects that vibration, they run over, inject that potent neurotoxic venom and the insect will be dead within seconds. There's no doubt that the redback's venom is powerful, but we actually don't know how strong it really is compared to other widows. In fact, we know very little about most of the inverts out here, which is a problem when millions of people have to share space with them every day, especially when our new roommates are some of the deadliest spiders on Earth. We came to Chile to investigate what's causing the conflict between humans and two infamous arachnids, the Chilean recluse and the six-eyed sand spider, as part of our mission to document the world's most extreme and dangerous wildlife. And we need to figure this out fast, because encounters with these spiders are only getting more frequent as they move out of the desert and into human spaces at an alarming rate. But why is moving in with us the best option for these arachnids to survive? To answer that, we need to understand what makes the Atacama so harsh in the first place. And it all starts in the Pacific Ocean, with a predator you'd never expect. It's getting away, it's getting away! I'm kidding. This is actually something we all really wanted to see. The South American multi-radiate sun star. Quite a mouthful, and that is actually, ironically, what it is best at. This is the apex predator of this tide pool ecosystem. Now the reason they call them sun stars is pretty obvious to see. It looks exactly like a cartoon sun that you would draw as a kid. And the reason they have all of those arms is because this is a predator. Sea stars are pretty much exclusively carnivorous in this part of the world. And what this guy would eat is any kind of clam or mussel. They'll eat small snails like limpets, and they definitely will eat other sea stars. Now the way they do that that is quite fascinating. They lock their body in place so they become significantly more rigid and all those little arms wrap around every crevice of the target and pull it apart so they can get to the meat inside. 
Now, just to show you how abundant these sea stars are, we have two of them right here, and that's very notable because, as I mentioned, this is the apex predator of this tide pool ecosystem. And one of the reasons that's so important is because there are species out here that would completely dominate and pretty much destroy the balance of the food web here if not for the control that species like sun stars provide, particularly sea urchins. If their population explodes out of control, they can decimate a habitat like this. You can sort of think of the sea stars like the wolves and the urchins like the deer. Urchins are primarily a grazing species and their populations can explode very quickly if they're not being regulated by predators like the sun stars. So that's why it's very encouraging to see both of these animals here and to see this species in such abundance because it's a great indication that these tide pools are doing quite well. The desert may be desolate, but the sun stars have all the prey they could need because these tide pools are attached to one of the richest marine ecosystems on Earth. So what happened to the desert that makes it so extreme? To find out, we have to look at both the ocean and the sky. But let's start here. The Pacific coast of South America is fed by deep ocean upwellings and the cold Humboldt current that runs north from Antarctica carrying with it an enormous amount of oxygen and nutrients, which supports an overwhelming abundance of marine life. This creates one of the most productive fisheries in the world, and supports hundreds of thousands of species not far offshore. So the question is, why is the land so extraordinarily dry? Well, it turns out this same current is to blame, but to explain why, we're gonna need some meteorology. See, the Humboldt Current doesn't just bring cold water to the region, it actually cools the air above the surface and forms a low-hanging mass of cold air in the atmosphere. But remember, this desert is still in the tropics, so it's hot. And this whole part of South America is affected by a large-scale climatic phenomenon called the Pacific Anticyclone which is a consistent high-pressure system much higher in the atmosphere that drives warm winds around the region and usually brings clear, dry conditions to the areas it impacts. Still with me here? Basically, you have the warm air from the anticyclone on top and the cool air from the Humboldt below it, creating what's called a climatic inversion that's pretty constant. The reason this matters is because when a cold air mass sits below a warm air mass, that produces the exact opposite conditions that are required for rain to form, so it almost never does. Add to that the effects of the Andes Mountains, which are so tall that they prevent weather systems from the rainforests to the east from ever reaching Chile's coastline, and you end up with a region that gets less rainfall than any other place on Earth, except one small part of Antarctica. The resulting habitat is extremely harsh and rugged. The plants are highly specialized and rarely grow large, so animals have to find other methods to avoid the intense desert sun. For most inverts out here, the solution is obvious. They avoid the heat entirely and only come out when the sun goes down. But when it does, the desert comes alive. Once barren, rocky wastes start crawling with life, including a little-known scorpion that Evan found, that to our knowledge has never been filmed in the wild before. Now this is the Chilean devil scorpion. Hey buddy, now he doesn't look too thrilled, which I wouldn't be either if a giant just came and kidnapped me. Now this animal is a perfect example of just how intense life can be for invertebrates out here in the desert. They're gonna be spending the majority of their time undercover. During the day, they pretty much won't come out at all because it's just too hot for many of the arthropods out here to survive. They basically get baked if they were to come out during the day. And so, a lot of the invertebrates out here are nocturnal, and that is absolutely true of this species. They'll be out here roaming the deserts looking for smaller arthropods, insects, even other arachnids they will definitely take down. And the main tool of the trade that they're using to capture their prey is their venom, which in this case is stored in the tip of that little tail there. Now, the venom of this species is not medically significant. It certainly wouldn't be pleasant. I imagine there would be a lot of pain and maybe even some swelling at the sting site, but it has nothing on the venom of our main target, the sand spider. That couldn't be more true. The sting of a Chilean devil scorpion wouldn't really harm you, but the six-eyed sand spider, one of the spiders we're doing this mission to investigate, can kill you with a single bite, and death is guaranteed. That's a terrifying adaptation. 
but wildlife in the Atacama has to deal with extreme temperature swings, constant sun exposure, limited food and water, and the intense competition for resources that results from those conditions. And all of the insane things that the inverts here have evolved are solutions to these challenges. For example, invertebrates can't control their own body temperature and can overheat quickly, so many species limit their movements to certain times to avoid the worst of the heat and sun. Moths, lacewings, cockroaches, and many other insects only emerge at night to forage, waiting out the brutal daytime conditions deep under rocks or tucked into sparse vegetation. Many of these tiny animals can't afford to waste energy on long, active searches for food, so they specialize on niches that allow them to get what they need without having to move much. Like smaller sand spiders that blend in perfectly with the soil and lie in wait for prey to walk past. And obscure stick insects that spend their whole lives on certain plants they've evolved to expertly mimic. However, the biggest challenge of all for desert inverts is getting enough water. But while most of them have evolved thick, waxy cuticles that cover their bodies to prevent themselves from drying out, one beetle has developed a mind-blowing method to pull water right from the environment itself. This is what we are referring to as a Chilean desert darkling beetle, because they have one of the most insane adaptations to life here in the desert that we have ever come across. Many darkling beetle species are desert-dwelling specialists, and this one is probably one of the most impressive of them all, because they have an incredible solution to one of the most difficult challenges for all arthropods out here, which is getting enough to drink. See, the Atacama Desert region is actually the world's largest fog desert. And what that means is that a lot of the plant and animal life out here doesn't get their water from rain or from flowing water. They get it from fog that forms over the ocean, which is only about a kilometer behind us right now. What this beetle will do is it will sit on ridges or hillsides early in the morning when fog is rolling in off the ocean and they'll sit with their abdomen pointed up with that big pan-shaped pronotum or the top of the thorax, the middle section of an insect's body, and they'll wait for fog to condense on their abdomen and even in the pan itself until it forms tiny little droplets of water on its body. And then as you can see, they have those really rough ridges on the abdomen that channel water into the pan. And then the pan, the thorax, channels that water further right into their mouth. And that is essentially the only way that these beetles are getting actual moisture. They do get some from the food that they eat, but the majority of the water that this animal needs, it collects on its own back just by basking in the fog. And I think that is just a fascinating illustration of how challenging life is for arthropods here in the desert. This habitat is extremely brutal for any animal that is this small. So for this guy, the only way they've been able to guarantee that they get enough to drink is if they do the work themselves. The darkling beetle's entire lifestyle basically revolves around its ability to gather water from the environment. And this is exactly the kind of biological secret we hope to uncover by studying extreme wildlife. This ecosystem is changing rapidly, and without efforts to document these animals now while we still can, we could lose any chance to learn from their solutions to desert survival. That's a huge part of why we life list the way we do. To our knowledge, our team is the first on YouTube to feature any of these species in the wild. And our goal with sharing them is to create a record of their incredible stories and hold humanity accountable for their protection. Understanding how these extreme animals operate not only helps us protect them and the environment better, but also provides answers to big problems that humans are facing. For example, it's pretty obvious why having the deadly Chilean recluse move into human spaces is an issue for the people here. But figuring out what to do about it isn't so easy. However, studying more of the local wildlife revealed that we have an unexpected ally in this fight. As it turns out, our best strategy to deal with the Chilean recluse might be to fight fire with fire, because there's another spider that's followed them inside. Okay, 
So this is a spider that I am very excited to see because they have a very interesting relationship to our target Chilean recluse. That is the Chilean tiger spider. And you can see where they get that name from. Look at the stripes that cover this animal's legs. That is one of the easiest ways to distinguish this from any of the other spiders in the area. And what I find fascinating about this species is that the Chilean tiger spider is a spitting spider species in the genus Cytodes. And what that means is that they not only have quite an interesting venom, but they have an even more fascinating way to use it. See, this is one of the most effective arachnid hunters out here in Chile. You can kind of tell just by looking at him that this isn't a very strong animal. Those are extremely spindly, thin legs. He has that tiny little body. There's not a lot of power to him, but he makes up for that with a real life Spider-Man adaptation, you could call it. This guy is a web spinner. Now, their venom isn't particularly toxic, but their fangs are heavily modified to be able to actually spit their webs a good distance away from them and stick any prey item that they're trying to capture in place. And not only can they spit their webs to immobilize anything they want to eat, but those lines of silk are covered in their venom. So they won't approach the prey item that they're going for until it's completely immobilized. And only at that point will they rush in, envenomate it, and actually take it down to eat. And I told you that this guy is closely related to the story of the Chilean recluse. And that is because you are looking at the only known arthropod predator of the Chilean recluse. This species is able to deal with the incredibly potent venom that that spider has because he doesn't need to get close to it to take it down. As soon as the web and the venom attached to it captures that recluse in place, he will be able to move in and get his meal. This incredible strategy makes Chilean tiger spiders one of the best predators of venomous and other hazardous prey items of any hunter in this desert. The good news is, because the tiger spider can adapt to any cool, sheltered environment that gives them enough cover and food, our houses are actually a perfect refuge for them too. Inviting another spider into your home is a very unexpected and maybe unpopular fix to the problem of dangerous recluses moving in, but it could also be the most effective, and the only one likely to actually affect their numbers long term, since you're introducing a control on the recluse population. The truth is, human and deadly animal conflict is never going away and we need solutions that will actually last. But coexistence is not easy with a spider as dangerous as the Chilean recluse. And before we find the right way to move forward, we need to answer a very important question. Why are these deadly arachnids moving in with people in the first place? If you want to find out the truth, check out this video, where we track them down for ourselves and work to figure out some ways to keep yourself safe around them. And with that, we hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you in the next one.